Good morning. Good Good to have you all here for really our first joint worship service is Living Hope Congregation uh, for Reformation Festival. Reformation, of course, 505 years ago on October 31st, 1517, Dr. Martin Luther posted 95 theses or statements of debate on the doors of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, and wanted to discuss some of the errors he uh, saw, uh, saw in the church of his day, especially in connection with the practice, the sale of indulgences, and which led to the idea of work righteousness, that one had to work for his, their salvation. Luther was rediscovering the truth that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, and the freedom that that then gives us as people of God. And that's the focus of the service today, especially that in the readings, that concept of Christian freedom, free from the works of the law when it comes to our salvation. The order of service is printed out for you in its entirety in the worship service folder you should have received as you entered today. May God bless our worship together. We begin with the opening hymn. Please stand. We begin in the name of God the Father who created us to serve him, in the name of God the Son who by his precious blood redeemed us from all sin, and and in the name of God the Holy Spirit who through word and sacrament creates and strengthens faith in our hearts. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, As we look into the mirror of God's holy law, we see that we have sinned against him countless times and in countless ways. We're truly worthy of his wrath and deserve eternal punishment. Let us acknowledge our sins to God.
that God has already forgiven our sin. It's not because of our worth or works, but purely through His grace. Our Heavenly Father has sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our substitute and bear our sin and guilt. Through faith in Him, we now have the free gift of eternal life. This is God's faithful word and promise. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson for the Festival of Reformation is from the prophet Jeremiah. We read in chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. Jeremiah, especially the second half of his ministry, was carried out in a time that was not a high spiritual point in the life of the people of Israel. God was about to send them away into captivity, captured by the Babylonians. But here Jeremiah prophesies about a new time coming, a new covenant coming between God and his people, one based not on the old covenant of the law, but based on the work of God's forgiveness in the hearts of his people through the Messiah. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. The Ring Praise Handbill Choir will now play The Church's One Foundation.
The second lesson, the New Testament lesson from Paul's letter to the Galatians, we read in chapter 5. Paul here emphasizes, in a sense, the same thing that Jeremiah did, that we cannot be saved by works of obedience, even to God's Old Testament law, but that Christ has freed us, freed us from that slavery. He kept it for us. In our place is our perfect substitute, and that perfection now is ours by faith alone. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated then to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The Word of the Lord. Our choir will now sing, Be Strong in the Lord.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson for today from John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Jesus talks about freedom. The Jews claimed here that they had never been slaves, untrue, but they were slaves to the law. But only through the Son is their true freedom, Jesus, the Son of God. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from he who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, since today is Reformation Day, we celebrate the basic gospel truth that God loved you and Jesus died for you and he forgave all your sins and God gave you eternal life for free. And I want you to hold on to that truth with clawed fingers. You will get it back in the end. But this morning, the Holy Spirit wants us to look at something. So we're going to. And it is not pleasant. But you don't get to look away, and you don't get to wish it away either. The Holy Spirit's going to remind us of the truth that we need to remember who we're dealing with when we deal with God. Now, pivoting a little bit here, how many of you know the band Herman's Hermits? We got a few of you? I guess a better question would be, how many of you don't know the band Herman's Hermits? Look, uh, kids these days, I tell you. <laughs> Long story short, in the giant constellation that is 60s music, Herman's Hermits is one of the brightest stars. I love Herman's Hermits. And my favorite song by Herman's Hermits probably is Henry VIII. You guys heard that song? I'm Henry VIII, I am. Henry VIII, I am, I am. I got married to the widow next door. She's been married seven times before. It's like a humorous, silly little ditty. It's kind of a catchy tune, but it's silly. But for those of you who know your history, uh, you'll know that even though the song might be silly, it's referring to something that is not. It's actually referring to kind of a dark, tragic thing. Again, if you know your history, you know that Henry VIII was an English monarch. And Henry VIII, in his life, as he was king, he married six women, not all at once, uh, he would marry a woman, fall out of love with her, divorce her. Marry a woman, fall out of love with her, divorce her. And he would keep doing this. The tragic part is, two of those women he got sick of and divorced, he executed. He had them killed. It's a silly song, but like I said, it refers to kind of a dark, tragic thing, kind of a dark period in the history of the English monarchy. The reason I bring this up this morning is not because I'm trying to be a bummer. It's because you'll notice that Henry could do that because every time he married a woman, he was still the king. In the relationship, he held all the cards. All the power, all the authority, all the might, all the wealth was with him. So in his relationships, it was always horribly imbalanced. He could turn and do whatever he wanted. And the other person, the wife in the relationship, couldn't do anything about it. It's horribly imbalanced. He held all the cards. And it resulted, at times, in a bloodbath. And brothers and sisters, as you know, uh, just generally in life, we don't like that. We don't like being in a relationship where one party has all the power. That's just not a good thing. So we try to avoid them. And I'm not just talking about marriage, but even like in friendships or even with employers and employees or even if you're talking about governments and their populace. We don't like it when one party's got all the power and they can turn and do whatever they want to the other person. That is not good. It can be tragic. Well, I hate to break it to you, but you're in one of those right now. Right this second, you are in a relationship with someone and he holds all the power, he holds all the strength, all the wealth, all the authority. He can turn and do whatever he wants to you. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
I'm talking about your relationship with God. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit wants us to look at this morning and remember is that your relationship with God is horribly imbalanced. It's horribly imbalanced. And that's not changing anytime soon. And I'm not saying this to be poetic this morning. I have to emphasize this is a basic, base one scripture truth. You're in a loving relationship with another party, he can do whatever he wants to you at any time, and there's nothing you can do to stop him. And this, by the way, has resulted in blood baths. Just ask Job. Do you remember Job? Old Testament believer? A man who by the Holy Spirit's own report was a righteous man. Job's relationship with Yahweh, with Elohim, his God, was, it was tight. He loved his God. And if you've read the beginning of the book of Job, you know what happens to him. In one day, God killed all seven of Job's children he slaughtered most of Job's servants, and then he took all of Job's cattle, like his wealth. He took everything. This happened in one day. And God, God fixed it so that Job found out about it in like a 20-minute span. God turned and attacked Job. He destroyed his life. And the text that we're going to focus on this morning from Job chapter 9, as I read it to you, these words of Job, it's him trying to come to terms, not just with what God just did to him, but with the reality of how imbalanced the relationship actually is. How much stronger God actually is. Our text for meditation from Job 9, selected verses. But how can a mortal be righteous before God? Though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? If it is a matter of strength, he is mighty. And if it is a matter of justice, who will summon him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. He is not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there was someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. This is the word of the Lord. It's also the words of a man, as you might have been able to tell, who is scared senseless. Job is absolutely scared senseless. And I need to emphasize this. Job is not scared of Satan or demons or death. Give me a break. That's a bunch of paper dolls. That's nothing. Job is terrified. He is filled with a mind-bending fear of God. He's scared of God. And again, you heard Job's words. He's basically saying, God turned and attacked me. He knifed me. He destroyed my life. And there was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't call him on it. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't accuse him of being mean. He just did it. And dear friends, that's what's even scarier about this. That's what frightens Job even more, is the fact that God killed his kids. God took everything from him, and he remained perfect the whole time. God was perfect the whole time. What are you going to say to that? Job can't even call him mean. 
There's nothing he can do. You heard what I read when Job said, uh, who has resisted him and come out unscathed? If it, is a matter, if it is a matter of strength, he is mighty. Who can say to him, what are you doing? No one can say anything to him. If he does something, he does it. Brothers and sisters, what's happening in our text is God is hitting Job in the face with the basic truth that the relationship is completely imbalanced. God gets to do whatever he wants. He can turn and do whatever he wants, and there's nothing you can do to stop him. You can't even call him on it. To really bring this into your mind, I will speak right now to all the moms in the room, especially you moms who have little kids. And what would you do if this morning when you got up, your kids didn't get up with you because God took them? What would you do? You can't stop it. You wouldn't be able to call God on it. You can't even call him mean if he did that to you. I mean, don't get me wrong. You might get angry and say that, but the accusation won't stick. That's the problem. He can turn and do whatever he wants. Do you now understand why Job is so scared? Why he's so beaten down? And brothers and sisters, up to this point, we have just talked about earthly things like life and death or God maybe taking loved ones from us or when he allows pain or suffering. We've just been talking about earthly things. But when you take this truth, the horrible imbalance between us and God, and you put it into the spiritual realm, things become a catastrophe. It turns into a bloodbath. See, this is what Luther found out. Luther and Job, they understood each other perfectly. Those were two peas in a pod. Because both of those men understood that God can literally do whatever he wants to you. That's the level of power going on. It's just that with Luther, he was forced to, forced to realize this truth on eternal terms when it came to eternal life. As many of you know, Luther was born and raised at a time where people told him as he was growing up, if you want to make God happy, if you want to start to bring the relationship back into balance, well, here's some good things you should do. And I'm not going to get totally into it because it was a very meticulous system. We'd be here all morning. But they basically came up with like an algorithm. Here's the good works you do and the order you do them in. And if you do them, God will really like you. And the relationship will start to balance back. It'll get better. Now, the problem was, Luther took one hard, long look at the Ten Commandments. And the same hot, sour, metallic fear that had been in Job's mouth started to bubble up into Luther's mouth. Because he looked at the Ten Commandments and he realized, I can't do this. I can't do this. And what's worse, I can't call God on it. I can't ask him to change the standard. I can't do anything about it. I can't even call him mean. This is what he wants. I can't do it, so he's going to kill me in hell and throughout the whole thing, he stays perfect, great. Luther was forced to recognize, God's going to give me the bloodbath of hell. And he stays perfect the whole time. I can't call him on it. And brothers and sisters, we need to bring this into focus this morning. I know that I have talked a lot up to this point about Job and Luther, and it has always not been easy to listen to, I, I admit. But we've got to bring this into focus. See, today we celebrate Reformation Day, but I sometimes think that we Lutherans, uh, we celebrate Reformation Day as if it was International Bash the Catholics Day. We show up and we decide that we're just going to talk about how those stupid Catholic theologians kept telling people you need to do good works. And rightfully, Luther rebelled against that. 
and talked about salvation by grace, which is true. That, that is true. I thank God for that, that Luther did that. It's just, do you really think that Catholic theologians are the only group of humans ever who fell for the lie of good works? You really think that? We all do that. This is so common to fallen human beings, it shows up everywhere. We all think this, that we can earn God. It, you, you look at any religion, you look at any philosophy, you look at any used car ad that you read, this lie is the basis of it all. You see it everywhere. The idea that we can earn God or make him happy, this is like a rash sinful huma humanity can't get rid of. And the basis of it is that we continue to underestimate just how big the gulf is between us and God. We continue to underestimate just how imbalanced the relationship really is and how perfect God really is. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is reminding us that the Ten Commandments are not God's suggestion box. These are not suggestions. He is deadly serious. He has revealed in his word, you will do these things or I'll kill you for it. And in the Old Testament passage when he says the soul that sins is the one that shall die, what do you think that means? He's telling us, if you do these things, I'll kill you. I will destroy you. I will knife you. I will annihilate you. I do not accept sin. And you take that further is that God has been blatant about this. He's been obvious. It's not as if God took his law, hid it under a runic inscription, and then buried it at the bottom of a mountain for archaeologists to dig up. He has been obvious with the human race. He has told us, I'm going to do this. This is what I want. You are perfect or I kill you. And when you and I look at the gulf between us and the perfect God and we understand the level of sin we have already committed, it's over. It's over. And the only thing you and I deserve is the bloodbath of hell. And now, dear friends, you understand the longing in Job's voice. If only there was someone to arbitrate between us. You could also translate that verse, if only there was a mediator between us, someone to lay his hand upon us both, someone to take God's rod from me so that his terror wouldn't frighten me no more. And by God's grace, you know who that is. You know who the mediator is. The one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. That Jesus gave up his life for you. I told you, you will have this truth back. It's the truth about your God. That he gave up his one and only son so that he could have you. And don't get me wrong, the relationship is still unfair. It's still unbalanced between us and God. It's just that God took that and turned it upside down. In love, your Savior saw you. And so on the cross, he took the destruction you deserved. God the Father loved you so much that as Jesus hung on the cross, he unleashed the bloodbath of hell that you and I deserved, but he did it to Jesus. And in no way, shape, or form was that fair. That was not fair. He was innocent. And yet Jesus stood there and took it. Your God killed his one and only son so that you could be forgiven and covered in righteousness. That was not fair. That was totally unfair. God still did it. That's his love. An infinite love for you 
And God took, in, in, the, in, the, in the salvation of Jesus, when Jesus died and rose again, God took every ethical mode of measurement human beings have ever invented and he ground them to dust under infinite grace. Oh, your relationship with God is still unfair. It's just that he's turned it upside down so that now he gives you everything. In Jesus, everything's yours. In baptism, when God gave this to you, I, I sh it's not as if you got wet once in baptism, like you got wet that one time when there was water on your forehead. Baptism sticks, folks. Since the day you became God's child, you have been soaking wet in God's grace. You walk around dripping in his promises. He has doused you with all of his promises, eternal life, that, the, the truth that he's with you second by second. Everything's given you in Christ. It's totally unfair. Big whoop. It's God's love. He made you his own. And you never have to worry that God's going to turn and attack you. No, he turned and he loved you. This is what you are in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers and sisters, that's it. That's the Lutheran Reformation. That's all it is. Lutheran Reformation is not hymns and organs or pretending you like Latin for one week of the year. That's not the Lutheran Reformation. It's this basic truth that Job and Luther and Moses and Paul and every other believer who has ever lived by the Spirit's grace realized. On my own, I can't earn God. The relationship is too imbalanced. But in Christ Jesus, God gave me everything. Jesus gave me everything. All my sins are gone. And Satan can scream all he wants. Every demon that exists can scream at the top of their lungs. Big whoop. It means nothing. Totally powerless. Totally pointless. What Jesus did for you cannot be revoked and it can't be undone. You are God's dear child. You are his people. All of this is totally unfair and no one can call him on it. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in true faith. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now join to confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father in heaven, bless this offering which we bring, prospering its work in your kingdom, 
to provide the pure gospel to others. May it be followed by our regular gifts, generously and cheerfully given. Let the example of Christ's sacrifice teach us the unselfish love and humble service required to bring salvation to others. In his name we ask it. Amen. We stand for prayer. Lord of hosts, throughout the centuries you have led your church into battle against the forces of this dark world. All that we are and all that we want to accomplish as your people would come to nothing if you were not the one who granted success. In the midst of the battles we wage as your church militant, lead us to cry with confidence, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Savior of the nations, centuries ago you graced this earth with your divine presence. The life you lived, the death you died, and the new life to which you arose defeated the power of sin, death, and the devil. With joy we remember your mighty deeds, and in faith we announce to the world, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. Lord God, you commissioned the apostles to go into all the world with the word you had taught them. You gave to them and us the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the waters of baptism, and the holy supper of your body and blood. Through these means, you have fed and nourished your faithful at all times and in all places. 500 years ago, you shattered the darkness of the medieval age with the light of your word, held in the heads, hands, and hearts of the reformers. 170 years ago, you inspired, inspired zealous Lutheran missionaries in our country to walk together in a united effort for the spread of the gospel. Now you are bringing us together, the members of Living Hope Congregation, to boldly proclaim the eternal gospel in our community. As we mark these various milestones, direct our hearts toward you as we proclaim, Shout joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Gracious Lord, bless our celebration today. Direct us away from any pride or glory that we might assume for ourselves. Move us to stand in awe of your love and faithfulness. Use the fulfillment of your promises in the past to bring us joy in the present and confidence for the future. In true celebration, we glorify your name, saying, Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Keep in your care, O Lord, all those we love, those who are close by, and those who are far from home. Protect them from temptation and every spiritual evil. Watch over those among us who are lonely or distressed, those who are afraid and facing danger, those who hold offices of high trust or who risk their lives to defend our country those who have pain of body or mind, and those who are at, this, at the hour of death. And also now, Lord, hear the prayers of your people, which we bring to you this day. O Lord, hear and answer them according to your wisdom and grace. And in our Savior's name, we join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. For the communion distribution, um, you'll be coming down the aisles where the ushers are from this side and that side at the same time to receive the bread. If you need to, you have the gluten-free bread, please come down on this side, uh, even if you're from over there, and receive that from Pastor Wentner indicating that you need that. For the cup then, you'll proceed to the center. The individual cups will be distributed by myself and Pastor Oftenberg. You can pull them out of the tray yourself. In the center of the tray are light-colored, uh, non-alcoholic uh, grape juice uh, for those of, the, those of you who wish that. If you re wish to receive through the common cup, then step forward to Pastor Wessel, and he will give you the, uh, the, the wine through the comp with the common cup. 
And then uh, those of you taking the individual cups, the receptacles for those cups are right here in the center, and you walk back down to your seats from the center aisle.
May this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand for the words of thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. may be seated. Greetings again to all of you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, it was good to have had you here for this first joint service of our three congregations and look forward to many, many more of them. I'm going to give you a second to greet the people around you, say which congregation you're from, introduce yourselves to the people sitting around you. So take a minute to do that. Okay, okay. Be, be sure to read through all the announcements and the green sheets in your worship folder. There are refreshments for everyone down the hall in our cafeteria. The main bathrooms are just past the cafeteria. If you need to use the restrooms, there are kind of emergency ones here in the, uh, in the locker rooms right here off the gym lobby. Um, as I said, be sure to read their announcements. Children who are here for, uh, and staying for Kids Club, our Sunday school, um, you go up right away. You don't get refreshments yet. You get them a little bit later, okay? So don't worry, there will be some left for you. Um, but uh, you go up the stairwell right here off the gym lobby and then go down the long hall into the church, the Woodlawn Sanctuary for Kids Club, and they'll be in the classrooms upstairs. Uh, parents, if you want to look for them a little bit later on at, at, uh, afterwards. Where is Pastor Wempner? Is it a go or a no-go? 
We'll do it? Okay. Those of you who are staying for Bible class, you get to go first for refreshments so that you can bring them back in here, okay? All of you, please stay, and, and, and there's room in the cafeteria, out in the hallway there, but Bible class participants, come back in here with your refreshments. The others of you, you've got the cafeteria to mill around in for that. Like I say, the kids will get their refreshments a little bit later. Um, so Bible class will be in here with, with snacks. Um, uh, bathrooms I mentioned. A couple other things. Um, there, after the second service, at approximately 12.15, there will be a voters meeting here in the, in the gymnasium where we need to issue two calls uh, for seventh grade teacher and principal for our joint uh, Living Hope School uh, starting next fall. Um, so voters, hope you all come back for those meetings if, uh, you know, leaving after uh, uh, this service today. Um, I'm pleased to announce that uh, uh, two of our teachers, uh, our staff in a sense from the, this current year, have all made decisions about their calls, and Mrs. Miss Mance and Mrs. Martin have both accepted their calls. Um, so those, the only ones left are the ones that we'll deal with today in the voters meeting. Um, two, two, two last things. First of all, over under the basket where Mr. McCain, uh, you see the night in Bethlehem, the information for really what is our next big joint activity, the living nativity on Saturday, December 10th over at Good Shepherd. And we need lots and lots of people. Mrs. Greppel, are you going to be standing over there if people have questions about that? Okay. So Barb Greppel from Good Shepherd will be over there. But there are sign-up sheets. All kinds of cast and characters and background people, uh, uh, helpers and attendants. So please take it. Uh, you can read about it in your, in your announcements. But uh, go over there to sign up for it. Or if you have questions, see Barb Greppel for that. Um, and then one reminder that next weekend, when you go to bed at Saturday night, don't forget to turn your clocks back one hour. Get that extra hour of sleep next Saturday night. Anything else, pastors? Okay. Oh, if, uh, especially Good Shepherds folks, if you want to snoop around our building, feel free. Uh, down the end of the hall and under the sanctuary and then the, the wing to the west, uh, is where our main school classrooms are. A couple of our Lamb of God teachers will be down there, Mr. McCain, Miss, Mrs. Wendorf, preschool. I don't know if Miss Mance and Mrs. Wickland uh, want to head down that way too. Um, but it, I think, yeah, they'll, they'll be able to answer any questions you have if you want to look down, especially at our school classrooms on this level. With that, good to have you here. Bible class participants, we're ushering yourselves out. So Bible class folks, get up, go get your snacks. Come back in here for Bible class in about 10 minutes. Thank you.